Has it really been over a year already? Whoa. I bought the Panasonic S1H in December of 2019 and for the past year have made all sorts of content ranging from wedding videos, promo videos, boudoir videos, corporate videos, some I'd even call passion projects. Even most of the videos on this channel have all been shot on the S1H. So after over a year of use, what do I think of it? And what are my thoughts on purchasing an S1H in 2021? That's what we're going to be answering today. And I'm also going to talk a little bit more about my video background and why I decided to purchase the S1H, even though I haven't owned any Panasonic cameras. Let's get started. You guys know me, I'm Dustin, your video tour guide. And remember to keep your arms and legs inside your chairs at all times. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. Hey, go follow me on Twitch if you want to have a virtual conversation with me about stuff. We talk about camera gear, I edit the occasional video, and we also play games. You can also join my Discord if you think this community is cool. Do it. So first thing, I want to give you a little background info on me leading up to why I decided to buy the S1H. I'll leave timestamps in this video if you don't want to hear this part and you just want me to get to the details on you know, my review of this camera. So the first camera I bought was a Canon T3i when I was in college or university, whatever you call it. And if you're curious, I did get my bachelor's degree in digital media with an emphasis in TV broadcasting slash cinema production. If you don't know what that camera is, it's like a $500 DSLR camera. And it was great when I was getting to know how cameras worked. At the time, I had a job as a video technician and I used cameras, but most of the time they were those big broadcasting cameras and someone would just hand them to me and say, follow the action. I was one of the guys down on the football field, like American football or basketball court filming. This is usually the part where you insert pictures of yourself, but I don't have any. So this will do basically an exact rendition of me. I was also doing freelance for a small production company that hired me for my editing. With that connection, I was able to get my hands on some Sony EX-1s, kind of just more expensive cameras in general, but the T3i was great because I was able to learn like what shutter did and how it affected the video or even photos. Same with f-stop and ISO, you know, that camera was really good at teaching me the basics but I outgrew that camera pretty fast and it wasn't until I was on my last semester of school I was able to buy my next camera, which was the Sony a7S. Keep in mind too, I was still doing freelance throughout school and I finally worked my way up and started getting hired to shoot on Reds. I mostly shot on the Red Dragon at the time, but I also got some experience with the Red One, Red Scarlet, basically a decent amount of Reds. So when I started using my Sony in my personal stuff, I always was trying to get my Sony to look like a Red because you know, the image is amazing on Red, but I hated using Reds and I'll tell you why. One, they are absurdly heavy and when you go a full day dealing with them, I wanna die. Two, the files are enormous and you'll be buying more hard drives a month than Starbucks coffee. And three, they're just expensive. Anyways, this all kind of leads up to my decision buying the S1H, I swear. Now, when I graduated from university, I got a job at that same small production company about a year after I graduated. I worked there for about two years and gained a lot of experience being kind of the go-to guy when it came to editing there. But the company merged with another company and I just wasn't enjoying the new way they were doing things. So that was when I decided I was going to go freelance. Now, I was still shooting on my three-year-old A7S only for almost four months after I went freelance, and that was when they released the A7 III, and it was obvious I needed that camera because I heard wonders of its autofocus capabilities, and it could shoot 4K internally. This was kind of a game changer for me because coming from shooting and editing a lot of content on REDS, I was used to having the flexibility to punch in super far on footage if I needed to because we tipped typically shot at 6K on the Red Dragon all the time. So I got that camera and eventually also got a A7S II. So I was pretty invested into the Sony ecosystem. There were some disadvantages though that annoyed me with this setup. First, the overheating. It could shoot 4K internally, but I could hardly get enough footage during a shoot because it would overheat. Even when I would do interviews, my camera after like 12 minutes of recording, 
would give me that warning that it might overheat. There were also some ergonomics things I didn't like. For example, the tilt screen, but no flip out screen. There was also no option to record anything in 4K 60. So basically for me, there was a gap in the mirrorless camera market of something that was more affordable than like a C300 or like an FS7 because there was no way I had the money for RED and wouldn't even want to deal with one of those in my run and gun shooting style. I did hear wonders of like the GH5 and I had a groom that asked if I would shoot their wedding on that camera because they wanted 4K. I told them of course. That was my first time using a Panasonic camera and it made an impression on me. I wouldn't say I loved the camera, but I saw why people did like this camera. It was like six months after that the Panasonic S1 was released. Keep in mind too, I was offered a job about a year and a half after I went freelance for the company I work for now. I work in global marketing as a video producer and basically do all of the video things. I shoot, I edit, I do pre-production, I just do everything now. Anyway, so I rented the S1 for a wedding and one of the projects I had going on at work. We were going to be filming a bike race in the summer down south in Utah, which is where I live. It is really hot down south in Utah in the summer, so I knew that we couldn't trust the Sonys. After using the S1 at that shoot, that was when I decided I wanted to get a Panasonic if Sony didn't come out with anything similar. Sure enough, the S1H got released and I started watching all the early videos that were shot with the camera and I knew I wanted to buy it because it offered 6K, so similar to like the Red Dragon. It had 4K 60 and it was, you know, super 35, but I, I didn't really care. And not only a tilt screen, but a flip out screen. And I can't forget, it, it had a fan as well, so it wouldn't overheat in all of those higher resolutions and higher frame rate modes. And then on top of that, it came in a mirrorless body. It filled that gap of like a higher end camera in a mirrorless body. Now I had some experience with the autofocus on the S1 and I had hopes that the autofocus would be fine because I had gotten spoiled from the a7 III and wasn't really using manual focus anymore. But because of my background using broadcast cameras, reds, and even the a7s, I wasn't too worried if I had to use manual. So there you go. Hopefully that wasn't too off topic. I just wanted to give you kind of an in-depth explanation of why I gravitated to this camera when I first saw that it existed. And I just kind of wanted to give you guys my background as far as video goes, like what kind of experience do I have? So now let's get into my experience with this camera over the year. The first thing I'm going to talk about is ergonomics and convenience. Now this is a mirrorless body, but it is quite bigger than most mirrorless cameras out there. So it is a beast if you're used to smaller mirrorless cameras. I definitely prefer like this size. Just keep in mind, it's heavy when you put it on a gimbal, for example. The layout and the buttons on this camera, I love. Probably my favorite thing is the tilty flip out screen. It's a small thing, but just being able to put my monitor pretty much wherever I feel like has been a game changer. I love the big record button on the top and on the front of the camera. When I've been producing content for this channel and filming myself, it's just so convenient to be able to press the button that's just right there. The LCD screen on top is also super nice. Even when the camera is just off sitting in my bag, I can look down and see how much battery it has. We've also got full size HDMI, which is also so much better than micro HDMI. Yeah, those are kind of my top features I love about it, but it does have some things that I don't like. The first is the shutter wheel. I've mentioned it before, it's extremely easy to accidentally spin this and you look down and you're at the wrong shutter speed. Another is the lens on lock button on the front. It's really close to these two buttons, which I love, but sometimes I will accidentally press that unlock button instead of the custom button. And then my camera does weird things because it thinks I'm taking the lens off. Overall though, the camera can be a little overwhelming just to look at, but it is very straightforward really. And I think Panasonic has done a really good job designing it and putting some extra time and effort into the ergonomics. When we jump into the menu system and actual operation of the camera, 
I have also really enjoyed this camera. I mentioned this in a video I did with Nate on YouTube that the menus are very easy to get to know if that makes sense. I think it only took me about two days to feel comfortable navigating the menus on the S1H and I kind of knew where everything was by that point. These menus are pretty much how most Panasonic mirrorless cameras are set up as well. So if you're looking into any of the cameras and curious about the menus, trust me, don't be intimidated. They are very well laid out. It's also packed with features I didn't even know I wanted or needed. For example, the IBIS is incredible and shooting handheld, it's been a dream with this camera. There's some cool video specific features too, like waveform monitor, for example. I don't love the waveform monitor on it because it's kind of difficult to read when you glance at it really quick. But if you are shooting on a set and have plenty of time to get your exposure, it's very usable. I did mention in one of my previous videos that I didn't like the histogram. I actually meant to mention as well, I don't like the waveform monitor, but for some reason I overlooked putting that in that video. It also has something called luminous spot meter where you can quickly dial your exposure perfectly if you have a gray card in your scene. Oh, it shoots at 48 FPS as well. I mentioned this in another video that sometimes 60 FPS is just a little too slow. 48 FPS though, oh, it's just perfect. You can also change to even more frame rates via the variable frame rate feature. It does have some limitations depending on your resolution, but most mirrorless cameras only let you do like 24, 30, 60, and 120 maybe. You've got time code sync via the flash synchro socket on the front. I haven't been on a set where I've needed time code yet, but it's just super nice knowing if I can get a gig that pops up where I need that, I'm covered without having to buy anything extra. You've also got anamorphic D-squeeze. I shot a little video on the DIY anamorphic lens I built, and man, that is probably going to be one of my favorite videos slash projects I've shot for a while. Everything just somehow turned out amazing in that video. It also has a setting called synchro scan where you can dial in your shutter speed to the exact number you want. It's super nice because it helps when you have some super cheap LEDs in the scene that are flickering. You can get rid of that as long as you can find the right shutter speed. Speaking of which, you can also change your shutter speed to shutter angle. I tend to just leave it at 180 degrees just for convenience, since then I don't really have to mess with my shutter speed when I change to different frame rates or even forget to change it. There's also something called frame record marker that puts a red box around your monitor so then you for sure know you are recording when you press that button. You've also got a time-lapse feature that'll enable you the ability to create time-lapse video in camera so you don't have to do it in post. It's also got DCI 4K, which is true 4K, not Ultra HD, and trust me, it's better. I don't know why it is, but it, it just is, okay? It's literally packed with an absurd amount of features that I've tried to cover on this channel, so if you wanna learn more about it, check out some of those videos. Maybe start with this one. Just like all cameras though, it does come with some things I don't like. The biggest is the tick box you can't get rid of when you shoot in manual focus. This one is super annoying because the autofocus I'm also not a fan of on this camera. So you're mostly shooting in manual focus. Like please Panasonic, all I wanted for Christmas was for you to give me the ability to toggle this tick box on and off. The rolling shutter is also not well controlled, but as far as a user experience, those are the three like big things that really annoy me on this camera. Everything else is pretty minor. Now, like I said, I've shot a wide variety of things on this camera and it's 100% taken my portfolio to the next level. My wedding clients have been blown away by the quality of my videos and they were even decent quality when I was shooting on my a7 III. But yeah, I haven't gotten one couple that hasn't commented on that. I've shot some run and gun promo videos completely handheld like this video and it turned out amazing. Oh, the low light is incredible. Even I was blown away because coming from Sony, those cameras do really well in low light and I was expecting the S1H to do pretty good because it has dual ISO but in all of my tests and videos I've shot in low light scenarios, it's exceeded my expectations. The skin tones are fantastic. I mentioned I've shot some boudoir promo videos and you know, these women, you wanna make them look flawless and just beautiful. And it was easy with the S1H. This camera also fits really well into a higher end professional environment. This is a video where I was mixing red helium footage I shot and S1H footage and can you tell a difference? I'd be super surprised if you could. And I gotta say, just look at the skin tones. Hmm. Lastly, I've used this camera to shoot most of my videos on my channel. 
It has been a little inconvenient with the autofocus, but I still have been shooting my talking head stuff with the aperture wide open at 1.4 and using autofocus. It's done a decent job, but it isn't perfect. So the final question of the video to answer, should you buy this camera in 2021? Personally, this is what I would do if I didn't own this camera. I would either buy it used because there are some insane deals out there for a used S1H or I would buy the S5. Now I haven't used the S5, but I know if the S5 came out before the S1H, I would have bought it over the S1H. Not because it's better, but it's just more affordable and you get a ton of the same features that come on the S1H. There are some things it doesn't have that the S1H has, like an optical low pass filter in front of the sensor. The S1H has better codecs like DCI 4K. The S5 does not have DCI 4K. Unlimited recording. Oh, and the tilty flippy screen. Mm. The S5 doesn't have it. You'd understand if you owned one. Those are just a few features that the S1H has over the S5, but with the S5 in the mix, it just makes it a much harder decision and I don't know if it's worth buying one brand new. It might be still because we have no clue what Panasonic will do this year. Personally, I don't think they are going to release another S-series camera. I don't know anything. This is all just speculation, but I think it'll still be another year before we get like an S2, for example, or even like an S2H. I think Panasonic could possibly maybe have a G86 in the works, but we may not even see one of those until 2022. Who knows? The one disadvantage to investing in this ecosystem is the lenses. They're great, but there is not a lot of options out there still available for the S-series cameras. L-mount is still a pretty young system and it takes a while to get lenses made for different mounts. There's a decent amount of signal lenses out there available and Panasonic does have like the most common focal lengths that you would want. Plus Laowa is starting to release some L-mount lenses. So it's getting better, but it's something you should be aware of even if you decided to go with the S5. If you're gonna be using it in like a professional environment too, where you have like, for example, an L mount to PL mount adapter, you're gonna be using PL mount lenses, then that doesn't really matter either. It does adapt really well to PL mount lenses. I've been meaning to make a video on the adapter. I just haven't gotten to it yet. Overall though, I have absolutely loved this camera. And obviously my channel probably wouldn't exist if I wouldn't have bought it. Did I also mention it's a great photo camera as well? I didn't, but it is. Anyways, I hope you found this video helpful. And if you enjoyed, be sure to give it a triple thumbs up. And again, follow me on Twitch if you'd like to come hang out with me or join the Discord if you like this community. If you support what I do, be sure to check out the links in the description or you can support the channel just by hitting the subscribe button and the bell button to be notified of future uploads. Until the next upload though, happy filming.